I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Good evening, welcome along once more to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on the radio box. Tonight on the show, I'll be asking how much power people actually have in the face of the government. And I'll have an expert in constitutional law alongside me. We'll also be investigating why gas stoves have become an unlikely hot button issue in the United States of America. And we'll be debating whether we'll all need to ditch the gas guzzlers and turn to electric cars. Plus, as always, a fantastic Great Britain and plenty of chat with my panellists, Emma Sale and Nick Tyrone. But first, an update on the latest news from Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The family of a missing mother of two have insisted there's no evidence whatsoever she fell into the river wire. Nicola Bully's sister, Louise, is urging people to keep an open mind and to continue the search. Nicola was last seen walking her dog in Lancashire last Friday morning. Police investigating her disappearance believe she fell into the river and say there's no evidence of anything suspicious. Nicola's sister, though, insists the river fall is just a theory. Her friend Heather says it's all too much for the family. As a friend of Nikki, I am struggling to see how we can take a, con a theory as a conclusion. Um, you know, Nikki, we need evidence to know where Nikki is. And as far as I'm aware, they have not found any evidence. So Paul and Nick's parents and sister last night, um, they're heartbroken. They are living a living hell. 
Um, and on top of that, they have all the speculation that comes out to deal with. It's too much. It's not fair. Health leaders are calling on the government to show initiative to end the ongoing series of strikes. The NHS Confederation says the health service will struggle to clear backlogs and struggle to improve emergency care unless action is taken. They're warning of even longer waiting times if the current situation doesn't improve. Thousands of nurses and ambulance workers will walk out on Monday in what's being described as the biggest strike day the NHS will have ever seen. Former medical director Dr Andrew Valance says the ball is in the government's court. And of course, they, they are worried about their salaries, but it's a, it's a feeling of lack of recognition of, of the work that they do. And, uh, and, and then you, you see, and they look at other workers in the NHS who are desk bound, who are working normal days, and they're working eight or 12 hour shifts without breaks. And, and they say, why can't we get better recognition for what we do? A number of houses have been evacuated in the Derbyshire town of Belper after a man uh, was arrested on suspicion of explosive offences. Officers were called to a property in Acorn Drive on Friday evening and a search uncovered a number of suspicious items. 100 metre cordons have been put in place and nearby roads have been closed as bomb disposal experts assess the property. Police say they don't know how long the closures will be in place for. The bodies of two British aid volunteers who died during a humanitarian evacuation have been returned to Ukrainian authorities. The families of Chris Parry and Andrew Bagshaw say the pair were attempting to rescue an elderly woman from the eastern town of Solidar in early January. The bodies were returned as part of a prisoner swap between Russia and Ukraine that has involved nearly 200 people. And this comes as the Prime Minister... Uh, and President Zelensky spoke earlier today on the phone. Rishi Sunak says he's committed to ensuring military equipment reaches the front line as quickly as possible, including tanks. Ukrainian soldiers began training in the UK earlier this week on Challenger 2 battle tanks, which Britain has agreed to supply to Kyiv. President Biden says the US will take care of a suspected Chinese spy balloon that's been floating over the United States. The balloon's now been spotted over North Carolina after flying over sensitive military sites in Montana. A second suspected balloon has also been spotted moving over Latin America. Well, earlier, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, postponed a planned visit to Beijing, calling the move a clear violation of US sovereignty. Uh, but he did uh, say he'd be prepared to resume his visit when conditions allow. China maintains it was, in fact, a civilian weather uh, airship, which had been blown off course. A sixth police officer has been sacked for his involvement in the death of Tyree Nichols. The 29-year-old died after being beaten by officers in Tennessee. Well, Memphis police have named this sixth officer as Preston Hempill, saying he violated policies on personal conduct, truthfulness and compliance with regulations regarding the use of a TASAR. Five other officers uh, have previously been fired and charged with second-degree murder over the death of Mr Nichols. And the Princess of Wales has launched a photo-sharing campaign on social media to raise awareness of the importance of early years development. Uh, Kate led the campaign by posting a photograph of herself as a baby with her father. It's part of her Shaping Us campaign uh, and she's hoping pe people will follow suit by posting similar photographs over the weekend. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Neil Oliver Live. There's a war on and not enough people know it. I'm not talking about the Third World War warming up nicely between Russia and the West over the weeping sore that is Ukraine, but the silent war waged by Parliament against we the people. It's not just between us Brits and our Parliament. Similar wars are being waged elsewhere in the West by governments against those they seek to govern, or rather to dominate. But the war being waged here against us in these islands may be the most important. Here in Britain, they like to tell us we have the mother of Parliament. It's hardly true, but it's a good line for the tourists. But if our parliament wins this war, it will have consequences for the whole of the West and the whole of the world. Those aware of the silent war know it's been going on for many years. 
Some learned souls will tell you it's been the stuff of decades, if not centuries, passed between generations of politicians and others. The strategic objective is total control of the people. This is being achieved not by bullets and bombs, but by stealth, sleight of hand and the misuse of legislation. Those in pursuit of centralised power, of a one-world government, hate, and with every fibre of their being, sovereign nation-states. That said, they reserve a special loathing for national constitutions that define the rights of people in perpetuity. Total control of the sort the state has in mind requires the hoodwinking of the people into thinking Parliament is the highest power in the land, that they tell us what to do. It's interesting to note that hoodwinking is a term from the art of falconry, whereby a falcon with lethal talons, the swiftest attacking flight and the sharpest eyesight of all living creatures, is kept docile and under control simply by having a little hood placed over its head. I called it a silent war and I mean it. Do you hear the dissenting voices? Can you hear the rage? No, that's because you're not meant to. For those involved, it feels like most people in the country are behind soundproof glass. No matter how loud the drumming with fists on that glass, too many carry on regardless. It feels like a bad dream in which disaster is looming in the form of a giant wave or a wall of flame, and yet no one hears the alarm being raised. Now we're in the end game of this war, and fortunately for us, right in the closing stages, over these last two years or so, Parliament and those who would control our Parliament finally overplayed their hand and by the high-handed application of disastrous and the draconian policies inadvertently woke too many people up to the ruse that's being played on them. It's as though after all those years of distance run, the last bunch handed the baton of the relay race for the sprint to the finish line have proven to be the clumsiest clowns tripping over their own feet. So much power seized so quickly went to their heads. But for all that, we have to concede that they tried their damnedest to get over the line and they're definitely still trying. For these last two or three years, the underdogs caught up in the silent war have literally been silenced, forced to shut up. I've always considered myself to be about as mild-mannered as they come, obedient to rules, respectful of authority. If you told me a few years ago that I'd be censored here in the UK for asking questions, I'd have scoffed. But here we are and here I am, like so many others, increasingly subject to censorship online. Too many broadcasters and journalists in this country, those inclined to speak up about blatant wrongs by authority, have simply been silenced, and far too many have been willingly and enthusiastically complicit in the slavish transmission of Parliament's message and the suppression of contrary views. And yet, three years later, and all manner of silenced views, those that were called misinformation or ridiculed as conspiracy theory have been proven correct after all. Scientists, doctors and other health professionals, a handful of journalists, People from all walks of life had their reputations trashed, their livelihoods destroyed, and yet they were right all along. But still the censorship and silencing goes on. Bill Gates, the self-appointed Lord God Almighty of science and vaccines, has himself come out and admitted the so-called vaccines he pushed on everyone don't work as advertised. But if I quote him on some online channels, that content comes down. The so-called vaccines are being withdrawn for the under 50s and yet to ask why, when those products are still described only as safe and effective, is to invite yet more silencing. Last week we learned, like it was any kind of surprise, that the government had deployed spies and sneaks to record dissenting voices and seek to have their voices silenced. Among them, the 77th Brigade, a psyops unit of the British Army that uses social media to help the government control the narrative and push its propaganda. MP Tobias Elwood, chairman of the Defence Select Committee and, in my opinion, a spymaster and warmonger, is the brigade's lieutenant colonel. Around the world, it's the same. Outspoken Canadian psychologist Dr Jordan Peterson has been threatened with the removal of his licence to practice unless he submits to, quote, social media re-education. In other words, stop saying what you're saying or there will be consequences. In this war, silence is the principal weapon. It's ruthlessly wielded by Parliament and its lackeys. Worst by far, though, is to silence yourself. Once the silence is accepted as the safest way, the only way, then the war is over. Now is the time to make noise, a lot of noise. Make no mistake, this is the end game. All of their weapons are in plain view. Digital IDs are almost with us. The framework of central bank digital currencies is already here. Surveillance cameras are everywhere, even in our phones and on the screens we carry every day. 15-minute cities are the new lockdown, the new ghettos. Everywhere they're proposed, they're opposed by the majority of the people. And what happens? The councils have the audacity to ride roughshod over supposed democracy and impose them anyway. 
expressly against the wishes of the people. None of us voted for any of this Agenda 2030 nonsense. And does that matter? Not as far as the so-called leaders are concerned. They just do it anyway. And always it's the so-called climate crisis, the greatest hoax of modern times. That's the stick being used to beat us. The justification for making us poorer, colder, hungrier, restricted in every way and monitored 24 hours a day. With all this ranged against us, what can we do? For a start, we can speak out, learn the power of no, no to all of it, march and protest before they pass legislation making that illegal as well. But our principal weapon in many ways, the only weapon we need is right here under our noses. Believe it or believe it not, scoff if you will, but it's our national constitution. Given that we are a constitutional monarchy and in May we are to watch crowned our new constitutional monarch in the form of King Charles III, right now is the perfect time to remember and be re-educated about what our constitution says and means. To cut to the chase, it exposes the lie, the blatant lie that Parliament is sovereign. Our constitution makes plain that Parliament is not and never can be sovereign. Our constitution is older than Parliament came before there was such a thing as Parliament, and so no Parliament can alter it, far less ignore it. Parliament is bound by the Constitution and yet cannot touch it. This fact alone must drive the would-be tyrants and despots in Westminster up the wall with centuries of frustration. Only we the people are sovereign. Only we the people have the final say, the absolutely final say on our governance. If you won't take my word for it, how about that of John Adams, founding father and second president of the United States? Quote, Should it be argued that a government like this, where the sovereignty resides in the whole body of the people, is a democracy, it may be answered that the right of the sovereignty in all nations is unalienable and indivisible and does and can reside nowhere else. Most importantly of all, even though the last, the vast majority of people have deliberately been made unaware of this crucial, crucial fact, is that only we the people have the power to judge the justice of the laws we choose to live by. This is not some obscure legal talk. This is simple, fundamental, and which is most important of all, true. It should be on t-shirts and badges. Every child should be taught this above all. Any government that empowers itself to write legislation and also to impose the punishment for breaching that legislation is a tyranny. Any people that submits to the idea that the government both makes the legislation and enforces it is a people living under a dictatorship. This power, this absolute power of the people is wielded via the jury. Generations of people in this country have been miseducated into overlooking this power. But the undeniable fact is that every jury has the power to judge the very justice of the law. When a jury hears a trial, even if it's proven beyond doubt that legislation, a law, has been broken, the jury may still set the accused free. Indeed, if trial by jury is being exercised as defined by the Constitution, even one juror finding the accused not guilty must result in a not guilty verdict. If you listen to this and think the power of the jury is awesome, that is because it truly is. And that's why we must never allow any here today and gone tomorrow government to try and persuade us otherwise. Every day that passes when we allow our government and our judiciary to blind us to that awesome truth is another day closer to abject tyranny and to the rule of despots. I mentioned King Charles. If we do, in fact, live still in a constitutional monarchy, then the constitutional monarch must swear an oath to protect the rights of the people, not the rights of parliament, not of the government, but the people against all comers. For more than a thousand years, our constitutional monarchs Queen Elizabeth II included, have sworn also to protect our national borders. Our democracy is founded upon the unquestioned, unchallenged sovereignty of the people. The monarch swears to protect our liberties without exception. If anyone, anyone tells you that our constitution, founded upon Magna Carta 1215, has been set aside or superseded, is simply and profoundly wrong. Here's the thing, and here's how we win the war. Either we live in a democracy in the form of a constitutional monarchy or we don't. If we don't, then Parliament better at least have the decency to tell us so and furthermore to explain when and how that happened. We are free people and sovereign. We're not granted that freedom by Parliament, but by the bedrock of our constitution, indeed by the universe itself. That constitution is much older than Magna Carta, 
which was only a 1215 restatement of what was already true and understood and made real by the much older common law. I've said this before and I'll keep saying it until the silence is overwhelmed and we begin the long task of remembering that we cannot be told what to do by government. That truth is final and can only be denied by those who either don't know it or who do know it and are lying. All of that's my opinion, of course it is, and you're free to disagree with me. So keep your tweets and emails coming all through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk or you can tweet as well at gbnews. I'll try to get to some of your comments later in the show. With me tonight, the businesswoman and campaigner, Emma Sale, and author and journalist, Nick Tyrone. Emma, do, do you feel that you understand how much power you have as a sovereign individual in the face of anything the government tells you to do. I think if um, <laughs> I think if my mum was sat on the sofa by you, she'd probably say since she was born. Um, she, um, I realise it and I think it's been frustrating. I think the last three years have been unbelievably frustrating watching that power taken away for no reason and people just going along with it. And, you know, the whole COVID mandates of this is what we're going to do. And, you know, just I think last week, you know, I wanted to smash the TV watching Hancock sit there and say he didn't break the law. They were just guidelines. And you, I sat there going, uh, hang on a minute. It was, is it just me looking back three years ago? Of, no, that was pretty much clear that you were breaking the laws. You'd be fined. You could be locked up. Then people these were the law. Jobs. People lost their, you know, jobs. People didn't sit there with, you know, dying relatives, um, left front and centre, you know, because we were following the new laws that were decreed to us when COVID hit. And yeah, so. Nick, do you yep. think? Do, or, <laughs> I think this should be in the schools. I think we mm. need a re-education program to let people know from the ground up mm. that they count, that they are sovereign, and that they can stand in the face of authority and the government and challenge them. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think as a culture, we've become, it's very strange. I was, I'm writing an article at the moment um, this weekend on uh, sensitivity readers at publishing houses, um, oh. just to let everybody know what this is. <laughs> Basically, if you, nowadays, if you have a book, what you do is you work on it with your editor, and then it's copy, it's all ready to go, and then someone who's a sensitivity reader reads it for anything that could conceivably be offensive to literally anyone. Um, and so, yeah, we have a very... You were talking about, you know, the, the, how government... How this is coming from government. But actually, it's sort of not necessary in a lot of places. A lot of... There's so much self-censorship that's going on uh, in places that really there, there shouldn't be. I mean, in publishing, uh, you know, I think back to, um, you know, in books like Tropic of Cancer or Naked Lunch or any number of... We, we go through them. Uh, controversial books. I mean, the, it was the publishing industry against the sort of the establishment that was trying to say, no, 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 freedom of speech. Uh, you know, what, whoever's offended by th something that's in these works. I, I had a novel run afoul of a sensitivity reader. Did years you? Years ago now. <laughs> I mean, right back. Right. Before, before any of this nonsense. But right. But five, six, seven years ago, I had a, a novel cancelled for precisely that. Yeah. But, but what troubles me, though, is the way in which people think that because a, a government makes a law, passes yeah. it through the, mm -hmm. the commons, and, and, it, and, it, and it becomes enacted and, uh, as a law, that that's it, that that's it. When in fact, mm. the constitution specifically states that the jury can challenge, can disregard that law as yep. being not good enough, as being inappropriate, wrong. <sighs> well, it's a, <laughs> it's a complex subject. I was thinking about this in terms of sort of- But it's been made complex so that people don't know it. Well, indeed. I think it's law. You know, yeah. yeah, but I was sort of thinking about this through a sort of Rousseau versus Hobbes, maybe that's too intellectual, I don't know, but, you know, kind of lens whereby how much do we need a sort of, I mean, just playing devil's advocate, how much do we need a sort of strong government that will lay down the rules sometimes? We'll come back to this very subject after the break, um, but we've got that upon us now. We'll, we will get back into this discussion about whether we live in a constitutional democracy or not, and I'll have an expert here in the studio to tell us more. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, 
balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay, believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. In May, we will be invited to watch the coronation of our constitutional monarch. For most, it will be nothing more than a fancy pants ceremony, full of pomp and circumstance, lots of colour and pageantry. How many, though, will pause to consider how central and fundamental to our constitution is the crowning and anointing of the monarch? My next guest, constitutional expert Will Keat, joins me to consider, and this is a question that troubles me greatly, whether or not we live in a constitutional democracy. Well, thank you for, for joining us. When this is something that goes to the fundamental power that each of us has, why have we all forgotten it or never been told it? I think largely that's because we've been had it educated out of us. And so we, we were just talking about that before and has why is that the case? Um, I think there's been some fun and games going on behind the scenes because it's not good for a, a political power to have a citizenry that is uh, properly aware of its constitutional powers. So, But it is true, is it not, that, the, that it is the people, it's never parliament that's sovereign. It's, correct. It's always an, it's not meant to be correct. A parliament. Yes. As long as your constitution is based on common law, that would be described as a proper, a proper democratic constitution, not because of voting in elections. And we'll, we'll, we'll come on uh, about that later, because that's actually adult suffrage. But the term democracy actually means something else. So there's another concealed, hidden mechanism within the constitution that's sort of been rather airbrushed out of our, our consciousness over a very long period of time. And that, as, I, as I mentioned and touched on in that, in, at the top of the show, it is the jury isn't yes. it? That people just think, they just go in there, 12 obedient people, judge more or less tells them what to do, and yeah. there's a verdict, and that's an end of it. Yes. But what is the function of the jury, really? Yeah, so the jury, I mean, we all know the first function of the jury, which is essentially to judge the accused uh, person before, before the court. But the hidden, concealed second purpose of the jury, that's the key. Uh, and what that is, is actually to judge the justice of the piece of legislation that brought the defendant into court. So to put that another way, you're actually, as, as a jury, judging two things. So when, when the defendant comes into court, you're judging the defendant, but you're kind of weighing that and balancing it against the piece of legislation, the statute, that actually brought them into court. And the jury has the right, the independent right, to judge on the justice of that piece of legislation as well. So, so the jury is not bound by that legislation? No. In any sense? No, not at all, absolutely not. So this is called jury independence. Now, I mean, they're a bit coy about this and, and that's why we're not being told. It, it's one of the, it's a very concealed concept. Uh, and generally speaking, juries are 
not told of their power and their right to judge the justice of the law. But they are absolutely... Uh, they have the right to, ju to judge on that independently of the legislation. So, you know, in the last couple of years, when, when, when legislation was, was coming down and there was emergency powers and all of the rest of it, and we were invited to think that, well, it's an emergency and you'll just have to do what you're told. Yes. That wasn't the case in no. terms of the, the independence of the... Well, it, it, OK, so the, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, simply because as soon as they shouldn't be passing legislation through, through Parliament, through the legislature, and there are a number of, of checks and balances that are meant to be in place to make sure that um, legislation, acts of Parliament that are proposed through bills of Parliament are meant to be checked, first in the upper house and then, of course, through the royal prerogative. And a lot of people get a bit fussy about the royal prerogative, but they don't actually realise that that's a protection mechanism for legislation that would be contrary to the, to the Constitution and contrary to the, li the liberties of the people. We are invited, aren't we, to think that the, that the crown, the monarch, is just a figurehead. But that's oh, yeah. not... No. ..and cannot be true. No, they're, they're the, the highest-ranking public servant in the land. They're the first among equals. And whose side are they meant to be on? Well, they're, they're meant to be on the people's... They're meant to be protecting the people, the people's liberties. Yeah, abs absolutely, that's the point of the Constitution. And so... They are, they are the sovereign, but they cede sovereignty to the people through that power of, of jury independence, trial by jury. That's how it's meant to work. And so, <laughs> not how it's working uh, now. And so, in, <laughs> and so in terms of, you know, when, uh, what happened while, while we were within the European Union, yeah. how lawful was that, that, that the national final decision-making power, the sovereignty, was ceded to, to Brussels? Yeah, completely unlawful, yeah. Yeah, absolutely contrary to the Constitution. I mean, do we live in... Are we... Is this a functioning democracy or not? OK, so it depends on what you mean by the term democracy, because there's been a bit of a twist in that word. And, of course, we're taught... To, or conditioned, if you like, into to thinking that the term democracy actually um, is, is all about voting in elections. It's, it's about uh, the majority vote. Um, and it's not, actually... That is adult suffrage. Um, the real meaning of democracy is specifically the emplacement of a mechanism into your constitution that allows the, the people, through the jury, to be the final arbiter of law. And that tradition goes all the way back through um, early England, the English constitutional common law, um, prior to, to 1215 Magna Carta, the late Saxon kings, into Europe as well. Most of the European nations were functioning on, on common law as well. Um, and then even back into ancient, the Athenian constitution in Greece. Nick, Nick we've been hoodwinked, have we not? <laughs> or is it just me that we don't get... We don't get told this. We're not invited to know this mm. about the powers that we have, which strikes me as fundamentally sinister. <sighs> All these powers are there in our mm. constitution, which we are supposed to care about. Mm. But if you actually make people aware of what's in the constitution, it fairly knocks the knees out from the government. I mean, I suppose I'd, I'd probably put it on the other... I'd, I'd probably put it like this. I mean, you know, voting in a general election is like, what, usually about 60% turnout, something like that? So we can't even get people... All they have to do is go to a ballot box and, you know vote for somebody and actually just getting them to care that much about it. I remember yeah. trying to register people outside of an ASDA once. Oh, my God. I mean, just, just literally just, can you just uh, take this form? I don't do that. That's not for me. I, like, like, as if I was trying to sell them something. It was, yeah. it was remarkable. It, Emma, it's dismal, isn't it? The, the disenfranchisement yeah, of I think people that... from their own power. It's that, and also, you know, it's even if even though people have the power to vote, most people I know will... Well, we're political nomads after, especially you know, after the last, you know, three years and even before that, the last decade, is, well, what are you voting for? Who are we voting for? Do we trust who we're voting for? And, you know, the behaviour, it's just been an absolute, they're, you know, suspect of incompetence. And but, but you, now, who, it's like, well, how you, do you know who to vote for? You know, for? As, as Nick says, people, no wonder people get dis yeah. disenchanted by it because it changes nothing. And so people are, have that pushed mm. at them. Oh, vote, yes, vote. That's your decision-making power. And what they're being, uh, what's being hidden from them is the fact that regardless of what the government is, you can intervene at any stage yes. by the jury mm. to say, oh, yes. that legislation's nonsense. It's, it's a much more direct power, constitutionally, that we actually have 
Um, that's how the, pa the people have the authority over their own governing administration, through that mechanism. Um, but the whole sort of introduction uh, and the, um, the, the, the increase in the, uh, the size and stature of Parliament is in a way all about that obfuscation and that confusion uh, in the minds of the people. Um, in that actually they, you know, we've, we've now arrived at a situation where, where we believe that the influence, and that's really all it is, is a little bit of influence here and there, um, is actually through this mechanism of voting in elections. But actually when you think about that, that system, the party political system, really only emerged in the sort of mid-1700s. And yet we talk about democracy as something, you know, mm. having come, come from this sort of ancient history going back to the time of Greece. Um, Just, it's, it's actually the time of Cleisthenes. It's prior to Plato and, and, and they, Socrates. They, took, they invited us to forget our power. Yeah. And all they handed us was the opportunity every now and again to vote for one or other cheek from the same bottom. Yeah. And that's supposed to be a democracy. Well, thanks so much. I could talk to you endlessly about this. Please come again and tell us more. Such an important topic with the coronation coming up in May. It's another break already. Uh, after that, we'll be delving into the row over gas stoves, which President Joe Biden and the Democrats have managed to cook up over in America. See you in a couple of minutes. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Rise. with me this Even morning. Even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Rise. You have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already to bless. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubilee, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree, that's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Here we are again, Neil Oliver Live. Every day and every way, our so-called leaders stick their noses into yet more of our business. You name it, they're coming after it. Our cars, our food, our energy supply, our money. They're already about to take away our gas boilers and even the humble wood-burning stove. It's an endless pillaging of the minutiae of our lives. Over in the United States of America, it's the same. Biden's lot want to stop Americans having gas stoves to cook on. But the war on ways of life is heating up there with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announcing plans to subsidise gas stoves. DeSantis is not alone in sending a note of defiance. Commentator Matt Walsh was quoted saying, you'll have to pry my gas stove from my cold, dead hands. My next guest is Greg Swenson, founding partner of Republicans Overseas UK. Greg, thanks for coming in. Good to be here, Neil. How's Biden's war on gas stoves going for him? Not well, not well, because he tried it you know, this is classic of the, the progressive left. When they can't pass legislation the way it's supposed to be done through Congress or through state legislatures, they, they work it through the, the bloated regulatory state. So it's, it's unconstitutional, frankly. And so they use these, these permanent bureaucrats that have been placed by, you know, or, or appointed by Biden. So they're unelected bureaucrats 
First, he tried it with the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and they tried to use this thing called the Federal Hazar Hazardous Substances Act. There's just generations of, of bloat, and so they tried to appeal to, you know, they tried to use that act to ban gas Did stoves. Did you say the gas stoves are bad for your health? Yeah, they claim that. They found some, some obscure study that nobody believes, and they tried that. And then they tried cost savings because it's going to save $21 over the life of the stove. <laughs> so a 20-year <laughs> life of the stove, it saves $21. Meanwhile, this is the same, these are the same people who have been very hostile to the energy sector and have created 60% you know, higher energy costs for the deplorables, for the people. So it's, 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 it's absolutely shameful. And so anyway, um, Joe Manchin and others pushed back against the, um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and the White House said, okay, you know, we're backing away from that. And a week later, they, they deployed the Energy Department, Jennifer uh, Grenholm, to, uh, to just use a different bureaucratic big state department to, to ban the stove. So um, I don't think it will work. I think there's already been pushback, and, and I, I just don't think it'll fly. And it, it's just people have said enough. So How is, how is would you rate Ron DeSantis's tactic <coughs> over the it, last while because he, he does seem to be at least grabbing headlines. Yeah, it, it's brilliant. You know, he, he knows he's got a gift for understanding what's triggering people, what's making people angry. And he's done it several times on other issues, which we can talk about. But in this case, you know, he's only the governor of Florida. He can't, you know, really control federal policy. Um, but he makes the statements and he makes it, uh, he, he makes it easier for everyone else to, to push back. And so, and what he what he did this week is basically said there'll be no sales tax on gas stoves, and and that was brilliant because it, it appealed to people and it, it just he calls out the absurdity of these government bureaucrats being you know basically expanding the nanny state and, he does and people seem, just don't tolerate it. He does certainly seem to speak to the people in a yeah. way that Joe Biden's people. <sighs> Definitely don't. Uh, uh, almost as though they don't want to. Almost as no, though their raison d'etre is to annoy the people. Because their their appeal is to the the blue state, you know, populations in basically Washington, New York, and California. So that's their appeal. They're they're only speaking to a very small uh, part of the population that is, you know, that that went to the same schools as they did, and they they love this virtue signaling kind of legislation. Although, as I said, it's not even legislation. They know it would fail if they tried to make the case to the, le the legislatures or to the Congress. So instead, they go through their friends in the bureaucracy. But what, what Ron DeSant Governor DeSantis has done is push back. He knows the, put the, the hot buttons that appeal to people. He pushed back against the absurd um, advanced placement course for African study, African American studies um, that was just loaded with Marxist garbage. He pushed back against that. He fought against you know, Disney and, and their, you know, th their advocacy of teaching, you know, fifth, five and six year olds uh, all kinds of garbage about, you know, um, you know, gender issues and all that business. So he pushed back. He sent 50 illegal immigrants to Martha's Vineyard, which I thought was hysterical. Uh, they only lasted two days there because the, the people so in the vineyard, to them, the people on the vineyard love immigration, illegal yeah, immigration, but not if it's in their backyard. So he's done this in a, in a, in a couple of spots. He just overhauled the board at um, a small university in Florida called New College and just basically brought in a diversity of, of thought. And, and just so he's really pushed back against wokeism and he's, and he's done it again with this stove issue this week. Emma, it's interesting, isn't it, that the same things that are annoying so many people here mm. are, being, are being imposed upon people on the other side of the Atlantic and they're proving just as annoying to the people there. Yeah, and I think that's with DeSantis, it fits into what we were previously talking about, is that he's doing it for the people, and yeah. he is ignoring the legislation or, and what people think, because it's not legislation. You know, he's at, he and showing that actually, just because Biden says it, you know, like in this country, just because Boris says something or Rishi yeah. now says something, doesn't mean that you have, you know, we, yeah. it's, it's this micromanagement. Everyone's had enough of, you know, you should eat this, you should drive that car, you should go to this place, you should travel here, you should, you know, it's sort of, everything's being pushed down our throat at the moment, exactly. telling us what to do and I think, and what to say and what not to say, that's going to offend someone, that's also going to offend someone. It's sort of, I just think people have got to this point now of going, enough, can we just live and make our own decisions yeah. a bit. Do you think so, yeah. Nick? Do you think people have had enough? The whole Agenda 2030 and the and the, the way in which we're being taught, you know, what gender means, what race means? 
Uh, all yeah, the time. Yes, and I think actually that's what DeSantis is playing into. And actually, I think that DeSantis could probably get somewhere with a lot of actually traditional Democrat voters who just yeah. have kind of actually in the quiet of the ballot box go, mm, don't like that too much. And actually, I can see DeSantis, you know, DeSantis versus, versus Biden. If you're in Biden's camp, I can imagine them really being scared of DeSantis, going, you know, you've got this very old, frail, kind of all over the place Biden versus, you know, a guy who kind of looks like someone who played the president of the United States in a Hollywood movie. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of yeah. DeSantis. Yeah. But I got a question for Greg, because sure. it seems like, you know, if I'm Biden's people, I'm really worried about DeSantis. And I'm praying Trump wins. The, 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 <laughs> I'm praying Trump gets the nomination. Just praying, because... Your, your, your tactics against Trump, well, you, you, it's easy. Tactics against DeSantis, much harder. Right. I think, and there's a lot of merit to that argument. And, I, and you're, you're seeing that in the polls. You're also seeing it with the donors, right. um, the big donors in America. And, and so, you know, Trump still has a great appeal. And he's got, you know, the 30 percent roughly of the Republican Party who, who are still massively supporting him. But there's great merit to that argument. And I think DeSantis, and, or any number of candidates, but especially DeSantis, would absolutely crush Biden in the general. And that's not really a lock for Trump, you know, and because he, it was so close in 2016 against a terribly flawed candidate in Mrs. Clinton, who was just <laughs> unlikable. And, and then he lost in, two, in 2020. So, yeah, there, there's, I think that's something that's worrying a lot of Republicans right now. Well, he doesn't. I don't understand why Donald Trump doesn't just take the opportunity to position himself as a mentor figure. Mm. Yeah. It, you know, be the father of the house, almost metaphorically, if not, <coughs> if not literally, just be that elder I statesman. Think it would be a, it would, I think it would be fantastic. And, and when you think about it, the, the likely candidates besides Trump, and especially in DeSantis, they're very much like Trump. You know, they're fighters. Trump, DeSantis is the best at it, but I, even Mike Pompeo, um, Christy Nome in South Dakota, you know, they're willing to push back against wokeism, against the government overreach and, and big state overreach. So, you know, I, and the, so they're, this is not the country club Republican Party of, of pre-2016. That ship has sailed, and I think, I think it would be a great move for Trump to I, do that. I was, I was talking, you know, at the top of the show about the, the way in which people have been uh, miseducated into thinking they're powerless, right. that they're next to powerless, and that what the government says goes. It, on the other side of the Atlantic, it, al it almost feels as if the Democrat Party, the Democratic Party, are, are doing something to almost leave the people there with no alternative but to vote for someone else. Yeah. I mean, if you were laying out policies to, to make people see that unless they go with the other guy, they're going to be powerless, yeah. they're going to have nothing. Right. It's amazing that they do that. It, and they used to be perceived as the party of the working man, of the regular people. And that's flipped completely because all they really care about or they seem to be focused with their legislation, with their politics on this so-called elite. You know, the people that went to Yale with, with all their friends. And they're and, saying and, to the people, yeah, we, we know you disagree with us. Right. And we know you're going to do it anyway. gas stoves or yep. whatever, but we don't care. And that's, mm. that's another reason why DeSantis just crushed it during the whole COVID insanity. You know, A, he followed the science, unlike the, the other the virtue science. signalers. Yeah, yeah. The, the virtue signalers and Fauci that were saying that we're scientists and we're following science, and they weren't. But also he understood that he's not a dictator. Even if he did believe in some of the of the lies coming from Fauci and the rest of them, even if he did believe that, which he didn't, but he, he knew that he didn't have the right to tell people that they couldn't go to their business and they, they could, couldn't send their children to school and they couldn't force you to have a vaccination. Uh, even though he was, you know, especially early on, an advocate of vaccinations, it's, a, it's an elderly state, and he was, you know, very proactive about because that. I, but, again, but he said, I can't make that a rule. I can't force up, you. He's standing up for the Constitution. Absolutely. Again, which is what yeah. I'm uh, harping on about here. Yeah. If, you know, he was, he was saying that this is unconstitutional. Right. That's exactly. Unless I allow you to know that right. you don't have I, to do. I don't have the right to force your four-year-old to wear a mask or to listen to some idiot talk about gender, you know, binary genders or whatever. You know, that's just not the role of... Um, you know, the, the parents and, and the parents have a right and um, and he's protected. So not only does he fight the wokeism and, and does it brilliantly, but he's at the same time, he's protecting the people. If only we and had someone job. on this side of the mm -hmm. Atlantic who was standing up and reminding people about our constitution yeah. and reminding us that we like we, our brothers and sisters in America have the power as the people. We need we need more of that.
and, and you them. know, you're seeing the pushback already. This is why Glenn Youngkin won in Virginia a year after Biden won that state by 10 points, because he stood up for parents and he stood up for children and stood up against the teachers unions who clearly don't care about children or parents. So it, it's it's a it's healthy. It's refreshing to see. It's not perfect yet. But I think we're seeing that that pushback and, and people have, uh, are just fed up. Just fed up. Thank yeah. you, Greg. Always Good to be great here. To hear you. Thank you. Always great to hear your insight. Thank you so much. It's another break, everyone. Uh, it seems like more and more drivers are going electric, but are they right to do so? Quentin Wilson knows plenty about motoring, and he will be here after the break to discuss it. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now, drivers are committed to an electric future, apparently. That's the finding of an AA poll of 13,000 drivers in the UK, with the majority saying they plan to switch to electric vehicles before 2030, the deadline for ending the sale of new internal combustion engine cars. Young drivers are the keenest of all, 88% of those polled pledging to switch, while drivers over 65 32% of those polled said they would never do so. Now, my next guest knows a thing or two about driving and cars. That's Quentin Wilson, and he joins me now. Good evening, Quentin. How are Hi. you? Hi. Uh, but polling, as with all polls, you'd, you'd concede, would you, that it's, it's the questions and how you ask them? Always. Yeah. So you're an, you're an advocate of the electric vehicle. Tell me why. Well, I've been driving them for the last 12 years every day and they are the default transport in the Wilson household and and you know I'd take the kids to school and and the, 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 the mums at the gate would point and laugh but here we are now and the electric car I've got will do 300 miles to one charge and doesn't ever have to go to a garage uh, the tires don't wear out it's made of aluminium it doesn't rust so for me, look, it's, it's a great thing. And I campaign for electric cars because I believe, and no car is green, Neil, absolutely. It's about air quality. The emissions from that car are zero. And all the research we have shows that these ultra fine particles that come from diesel and petrol have a really, really detrimental effect on our health. Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer. There was a study last week in California asthma. So this has to be a good thing. But what about the, when you factor in the energy in the production, which has to be factored in across the lifetime of the electric vehicle? And as I understand it, when you factor all of that in, and they're all burning, the, the, the production of electric vehicles is burning fossil fuels. It's, it's 
about three quarters is what the electric car uses up compared to the you know the hundred percent the the four quarters that, that an internal combustion car produces across its lifetime if you factor in how much energy goes into its production so okay the, when the car's running it's been made and it's running on the road it's not generating the pollution but that pollution is already there as a as a product of its making but you, you, you pollute when you make a, a combustion car and then the oil that you take out the ground and then you refine and then you transport do you believe, it in, do you in believe ships in with to, bunker diesel. To, to get to where I really want to be, do you believe that the plan is genuinely for 30 million petrol cars, diesel cars, to be replaced with the same number of electric vehicles? Because I, th I think it's about having fewer cars. It is about having fewer cars. A lot but fewer. But the cars that we have, and absolutely, we need fewer cars, but the cars that we have must be as clean as possible in terms of emissions. And that's what electric cars are all about. They're also, Neil, a gateway to a transition from fossil fuels to renewable, hydro, uh, wind, solar, uh, all, all but, these important but nuclear... you can't make renewable... You can't make electric vehicles with renewable energy because there's not enough energy in it. Well, so... I'll what, what happens when, when, the, when the first generation of electric... Well, I know you've been at this for a long time, but the, this generation of electric vehicles, when they come to the end of their lives, if by the, in 20 years' time we've done away with uh, the, the, the conventional energy supplies that we've been using up until now, and it's all about renewables, we're not going to have the energy and we're also not going to have the necessary raw material to produce the next generation, the next iteration of those electric vehicles. But you can't say that with any certainty now without looking into your crystal ball. And, and the materials for batteries, yes, there's, there's, there's lithium and there's cobalt, and there are issues with those. But we don't know how much lithium there is in the world because we've only just started looking for it in the last five, ten years. And there's loads and loads under the sea. So it's but also, more mining, more ecosystems to be destroyed, well, more toxicity, more displaced people. Oil... Doesn't oil do that as well? Yes, but the, but the point is that the green alternative, the electric vehicle, is being sold to us as a clean green alternative, and I say that's a bait and switch. It's, it's a cleaner car in urban areas because of its emissions. No car is green, Neil, it's as simple as that, but these are greener than combustion cars, and that's the point. The carbon emissions you make from mining oil, um, uh, drilling oil and, and, and mining lithium. Yeah, we, we, we don't, don't want that. But we will have better battery chemistries where you don't have things like... Even Bill lithium. Gates, in his book about how to cure the climate crisis, says that the, the batteries are almost at their peak now. You, you, might get an, you might get more from another generation of batteries, but you're never going to get the efficiency that you get from conventional fuel. Even Less Bill Gates Bill, concedes that. But he's, he's not a, a, a battery expert, is well, he? It doesn't. He's not, he's no. not an expert on anything, but it doesn't look, stop him. This is it. nascent technology, Neil. So why are we trying to shoot it down when the goals are cleaner air, energy independence and cheaper energy for but all? Where are you going to get the infrastructure? Where are you going to get the infrastructure from for all of these electric vehicles? What's going to power them? We're going to have to build it and it's going to have to be a mixture of nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, and there will be gas involved there, but it will be creating less pollution than we have at the moment. So, look, it, it, if the goal of, of cleaning up our, our, our atmosphere and not being reliant on fossil fuels and hydrocarbons and buying them for ever-increasingly high prices, that's a laudable social goal, isn't it? Emma, do you see my frustration with the... Yeah, I'm, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm with you. The, you know, and you touched on it... Earlier, the, the basically, it's a seven, it's electric cars have 70% more carbon oh, that's footprint. That's not been proven, than, absolutely. It, the facts are out there. Like Volvo did a massive yeah, study, Volvo, that, Volvo and the carbon footprint not... of the elect, of their electric car was way higher than the petrol. It was something like... It had to, the electric car had to go 150,000 kilometres before it became as... That as stat and that's... that's and lithium good. batteries, let's talk about the child labour, you know, mining, the 70% of lithium and cobalt mining are being... And that's child labour. You go, OK, fine. Is in so your... that the Cities in the UK Computers have cleaner phones, air. I'd uh, rather how I'd rather I would rather on years my years. conscience know that what I'm driving as a whole from the minute it was a conception and produced is better for the world as a whole, not oh it's gonna be more economic, you know, environmentally friendly. Burning for... petrol and diesel and polluting. I am it. in my hybrid car. Nick, I see it's, it's a, a bait, I see it's a bait and switch. <laughs> I think we're being sold it because they say it's it's better for the planet. 
and I say the reality is it's anything but. That's my... You have, have whatever you want. Have a V8. Have anything you like as far mm. as I'm concerned and you can afford it. But don't tell me that it's saving the planet. And where does that take us, Neil? Well, just don't tell me it's saving the planet. It's not saving the planet, it's cleaning our air. Plus. And changing <laughs> our energy systems. I mean, I would agree on the cleaning the air thing. Having lived in London for now 25 years, um, I, my, 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 it's, my lungs have certainly paid the price for that. And actually having less, um, having less emissions in the air would be, would be great. Uh, and if we can do it without actually we're just changing the cars over. I guess my, my real worry is about infrastructure and, and where that's going to come from. That's my, that's, that's my well, only hang-up. It's just where, where is it coming from? talking about Biden earlier on and his Infrastructure Reduction Act, that's, what, $300 billion? Mm. Now, that's what this government needs to start mm. thinking about. How are we going to build this stuff and how are we going to create economic activity and jobs and, 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 and benefit the... We're gonna have to, I'm going to have to pull it there because we're just running out of time. Quentin Wilson... <laughs> Motoring expert, thank you so much. It's a, another conversation that could run and run. It's coming up to <laughs> 7 o'clock. This is Neil Oliver Live on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. Coming up after the break, in the second hour of the show, we'll be meeting this week's Great Britain and learning about some welcome help for the farming community. See you in two minutes. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us. Across the entire United Kingdom, we cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good evening, lovely people, and welcome back to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on radio. Tonight, on the second hour of the show, I'll shortly be talking to this week's Great Britain, who's going to do a skydive from 10,000 feet to raise money to support students with special educational needs and disabilities. It has not been a great time for farmers, but help is hopefully at hand for some. I'll be learning about a new website which will help them to sell their products more locally and maybe cut out some of the bigger supermarkets and the rest of the middlemen. I'll be meeting the woman who made the powerful new documentary film which lifts the lid on some dubious practices in the fashion industry. Plus, by becoming a driving instructor, it's becoming an increasingly popular second job and how takeaway pasta has become the latest big food fad. But first, an update on the latest news from Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. This uh, just into us. Officers investigating the disappearance of Nicola Bully are appealing for a key witness who they believe was in the area that morning. Now, the 45-year-old mother of two was last seen walking her dog in Lancashire last Friday. And officers now say they want to speak to a woman wearing a yellow coat who was seen on CCTV pushing a pram in the area 
where the dog walker disappeared. And Nicholas' family have, have questioned the official police theory that she fell into the river. Her friend Heather says it's all taking a heavy toll. As a friend of Nikki, I am struggling to see how we can take a, con a theory as a conclusion. Um, you know, Nikki, we need evidence to know where Nikki is. And as far as I'm aware, they have not found any evidence. So Paul and Nick's parents and sister last night, um, they're heartbroken. They are living a living hell. Um, and on top of that, they have all the speculation that comes out to deal with. It's too much. It's not fair. Health leaders are calling on the government to show initiative to end the ongoing series of strikes. The NHS Confederation says the health service will struggle to clear backlogs and improve emergency care unless action is taken. They're warning of even longer waiting times if the current situation doesn't improve. Thousands of nurses and ambulance workers will walk out on Monday in what's being described as the biggest strike day the NHS will have ever seen. A number of houses have been evacuated in the Derbyshire town of Belper after a man was arrested on suspicion of explosives offences. Officers were called to a property in Acorn Drive on Friday evening and a search uncovered a number of suspicious items. A 100-metre cordon remains in place. Nearby roads have been closed as bomb disposal experts assess the, the property. The police say they don't know how long the closures will be in force for. The bodies of two British aid volunteers who died during a humanitarian evacuation have been returned to Ukrainian authorities. The families of Chris Parry and Andrew Bagshaw say the pair were attempting to rescue an elderly woman from the embattled eastern town of Solidar in early January. The bodies were returned as part of a prisoner swap between Russia and Ukraine involving nearly 200 people. President Joe Biden says the United States will take care of a suspected Chinese spy balloon that's been floating over the country. The balloon has been spotted now over North Carolina, uh, having flown over sensitive military sites in Montana. A second suspected balloon uh, was earlier spotted moving over Latin America. China maintains it was a civilian weather airship which had merely been blown off course. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now, back to Neil Oliver Live. Thank you for that, Aaron. Tonight's Great Britain is throwing herself into an effort to raise funds for charity supporting students with special needs. In point of fact, Tia Hughes from Shropshire plans to actually throw herself out of a plane at 10,000 feet, her first ever skydive. Tia joins me now. Good evening, Tia. Thanks for joining us. Hello. What did your family say when you told them you were going to jump out of a plane? Um, my mum and her partner were happy because they've both done it for charity themselves. Um, but my partner said he'll pay me not to do it. <laughs> it's... You've got a few weeks to go. It's in April. Um, how are you? How are your nerves when you're waking up in the morning? Is it something you think of and you're looking forward to or not? Um, not really thinking about it at the moment. <laughs> when it comes to it, I think I'll be um, very nervous. Um, you say you say your uh, you say your mum and her partner have done this themselves. It, 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 is skydiving or or in whatever form you jump out the back of a plane? Is it something you think you would have done anyway? Was it was it on your on your wish list, your bucket list? I've always thought about it, but um, I never thought I'd go through with it. So, do you think it'll be the first of many? Do you think uh, can you see yourself taking this up as a as a pastime? Um, depends how the day goes. <laughs> Tell me, tell me, Tia, about the college that you, where you work at Derwent College in Oswestry. Street. You tell me about the way in which it's that, it's, it's the encounters you have there that's inspired you to this, to this act. Um, so we teach um, young adults with disabilities to be more independent and to live normal lives like we do. Um, and we challenge our students on a daily basis to um, push, and we push them out of their comfort zones. So we as staff need to be leading as a leading by example. Um, 
So that's what I'm trying to do, <laughs> pushing myself out of my comfort zone. Yes, I think it's hard to imagine being further out of a person's comfort zone than jumping out the back of a plane. I think it's safe to say you'll be leaving your comfort zone. Uh, come to yeah. you, Emma. Is, Emma, is this something you would ever contemplate? Would you jump? Would you? Would you skydive? You know, what? I'm, I'm terrified of heights, so. But I do. I do a lot of. I, I love pushing myself out of my comfort zone for sports stuff, and I've done a lot of crazy challenges all around the world. But. I always say, like, the bungee, bungee jumping or jumping on an aeroplane. I can't even go on a swing without my stomach wanting to come out my mouth. So, um, I've, yeah. always, I've always drawn the line at it. You know, over the years when I was making a, a different kind of television, you know, I was asked to do all sorts of things. You know, I've been up in stunt planes and I've abseiled and I've scuba dived. And because I've got kids, I always said I wouldn't mm. jump out of a plane. Because... Just in case the parachute doesn't yeah. open. For me, that's just <laughs> a step too far. Would you do it? No, I'm exactly you've just actually said exactly what I was thinking was when I was younger and didn't have kids I might have I might have gone yeah let's do it now that I'm a bit older you know a bit more tired um, and have three kids it's it's plays in the back of your mind why why am I risking my life and in a sense there you know something about their future yeah. water-based and land-based also yeah. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Tia have you ever have you done the likes of have you um bungee jumped or have you done any of those other kind of adrenaline junkie type uh, pastimes? Um, I've done a bit of abseiling, but um, a bit of scuba diving, but that's about it. Uh, how much do you think you'll be looking to raise in terms of the fundraising for the for the college? Um, well, because Derwin is a charity based organisation. Um, Funding's always ongoing, uh, charity raising's always ongoing, so there's never a set limit of what we're achieving, um, so as much as we can, really. And if viewers are watching and are inclined to help, uh, how, how can they go about, uh, you know, finding your particular fundraising effort? So, um, Derwin College have a website and they have a charity page, um, so they can donate on there. Or I have a GoFundMe page, um, that's called Die for Derwin. Excellent, Tia. Look, thank you. You're absolutely living up to the idea of, of being a great Briton. I'm very impressed. Uh, you know, as you probably heard us discussing here, it's, uh, I think the, the three of us in here, you know, draw the line at falling out the back of aircraft at 10,000 feet. <laughs> but uh, if you can find it in your heart to, to take that leap of faith for your pupils, for your students, then all power to your elbow. So thanks very much for joining us, Tia. Thank you for having me. Perfect. It does, it does uh, beg the question, you, know, you say you're, you're happy to be pushed out of your, your comfort zone, but you know, do, you have, do you have other limits or are, are there things that you aspire still to do in terms of... Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing crazy challenges probably for about 20 years and I think, to me, it's a, it's a big part of my identity. It's a big part of... Because it translate for me, it translates into the rest of my life. In that, if you can get into that fear bubble and you can really, I like the mental, the mind games it plays on you to be terrified, and you have there's a switch goes in your head where you suddenly go into a different energy state of, and that, and then it just goes through into business and For life instance, and everything. Though, what, when you describe that, what things have you done where you've stepped into what um, you call that bubble? So I did the fear. marathon de Saab, which is sort of. It's six marathons in seven days across the Sahara Desert, um, self-sufficient. And, and, you know, for that, you know, we're an example in that. There was a massive sandstorm and I was stuck, stuck behind a sand dune on my own. And they're on day three going, that's it, I'm just going to quit. And I just sat there and thought, no, that involves me going home, telling people I haven't done it, telling my family I haven't done it. And that just absolute fear of failure... And not wanting to, just a switch went and I, I was just in a different mode for the next four days. And then I sort of, it just then came into the, my business life of every time you, you know, you feel that fear, you know you can deal with it. it yeah. Did you say six marathons in seven, in seven days? So you're running 26 miles every day for Yeah, what? and there's a 50 in the, mile, yeah, in there's the a, desert. Yeah. Jesus. And when my you feet say, were disgusting. <laughs> when you say self-sufficient, I mean, were you put... You carry your food for the week, your sleeping bag, you sleep in tents that are put up. Um, and, I mean, it was, it was incredible. And I, I run a thing called The Sisterhood I've been doing for 15 years, which is exactly that, getting, especially girl, women, into, um, 
to go out of their comfort zone and do crazy adventures. You know, a few of us relay swam the channel. We did a relay run race from LA to Vegas in 2019. And um, it's just, it's just something, I don't know why I do it, I'm addicted to how it. Much of, <laughs> how much of the channel did you swim for your part of the relay? Um, quite a lot, because there were only four of us. There were meant to be eight, and then wow. the weather oh. shifted, so two couldn't make the date we then got, and then one was ill. And so actually, the, we, did our, we did an hour on and just kept relaying the four of us. God, you see, I, I find that, <laughs> those things that you've just described, far more impressive. Really. I mean, if, mm. if you jump out of a plane, well, either your parachute yeah. opens or it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, there's not much control. Not, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're in the lap of, the, you're in the, lap mm. of the gods at that point if you didn't pack your own parachute. Um, but what you're talking about is a sustained painful, mm. child, physically yeah. devastating I'm, I'm challenge. For that, that pain. I don't know what, I don't know what it is. I just, it's, you know, I'm, as I said, and, and also, you know, I've always been a sports geek and I did sports science degree and a big sports psychology side of it, side of it. And there, you know, there's so much in that, the, the fear side of it and pushing yourself and that resilience. So it's, it's funny, the fear, I remember I, I, when I was making a, a particular documentary series called Coast, I met, I met a lot of mountaineers and climbers, and they all talked about, and some of them even used the same expression, they talked about feeding the rat. Mm. You know, because mm. I, I said, because I had to do a bit from time to time, mm. and it was, yep. I was scared. And they would say, yeah, we're, I'm always scared as well, but that's, but I, we have to feed the rat. Mm. You know, and I, that, that was a real eye-opener for me, that they were going in search of that feeling. Mm. They knew that they were going to go and be frightened, but they had to go and be frightened. It was... Yeah, because it's the getting over it. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the fear. I can't describe it. That, that feeling of you've talked yourself round and got over that fear and you're still, and you've pushed through the endorphins and, yeah, it's really a bit of a drug in my head. Amazing. <laughs> Got to go to another break, uh, after which I'll meet the filmmaker who has made a documentary shining a light on some of the darker parts of the fashion industry. Plus, uh, we'll be hearing about a website which will hopefully help farmers to see their, uh, sell their produce more locally. See you shortly. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stumped. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubri, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise. with me this even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Surprise. You have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yes. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us. Across the entire United Kingdom, we cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. 
We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. All around the world, farmers are under ever-increasing pressure. The Dutch government has effectively declared war on its farmers, even firing live rounds at those seeking to defend their way of life. Across Europe, there's more unrest. COP27, is that the right number? I lose track. It was all about food and how governments should cut back on farmland and force their farmers and put their farmers out to grass. Farmers are fighting back, though. And here in the UK, a new initiative and a new website should make us all more aware about where our food comes from, as well as boosting our awareness of our local farmers and food producers, and about how we can bypass the supermarkets and go straight to the source. So my next guests, farmer Gareth Wynne-Jones and Catherine McBean, founder of the People's Health Alliance, both join me now to tell us more. Good evening to you both. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you again. Gareth. Um, tell me, uh, Gareth, what is the idea behind this? What, what's the inspiration? It's just to bring the power back to the people, you know, to the farmers and to um, people can source local, seasonal, regenerative um, food from the people that are producing it. And, um, you know, it, it, it has to be done because there's, there's so much power that's taken away from us as producers so if we can bring that back into um our power and you know educate the next generation about the food we're producing and get them on board it's going to be healthier it's going to be better for the environment and it's going to be better for everyone really catherine it, it's a bit of an altered mind state that we need don't we because people are so accustomed to just either going to the supermarket physically or just shopping online from a supermarket, how how do we re-educate ourselves about how to go straight to the producers? You know how to cut out the middleman. It's it's quite an ask, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean it's going to take a bit of a transitional period for us all to get there. But what we're trying to do is um, through the website, through other tools, through working with partners affiliates across the UK is uh, to educate the British public on what they can do, where they can go. So, for example, we are partnering up with the Open Food Network, which is an open source platform whereby farmers, producers, local community groups can go on there. Uh, it shows where they are on a map and you can go and find producers and farmers who are happy to work directly with consumers um, in their local region. And we're supporting that through PFFA, um, as well as working with other groups like the Pharmacy Cooperative, because um, this really is about collaboration. This is about us all coming together. And through the website, we hope to um, educate, but also through doing public Zooms and bringing our partners and affiliates on so they can speak about their particular area of expertise and we can share that out with the public. But it is now a time for us all to come together and uh, start taking a little bit more responsibility for our food because those that should be aren't very clearly and it is down to us the people and through pffa and through pha the models we build are about returning power to the people about de decentralizing from the big conglomerates from the big organizations that have currently and for some time had a big grip on what food production looks like and it really is about creating those models to decentralize that power get it back to the farmers and producers and in turn back to the people Power back to the people. I'm all I'm all in favour of that. Uh, Gareth, I know a lot of people are uh, are invested now in knowing more about where their food comes from. You know, they care about animal welfare. I would say a lot of people are are very much aware of the necessity to give uh, the animals that become our food decent lives. You, you know, and will this will this kind of initiative? Do you think that will let people be reassured? having that more direct relationship with where the beasts are raised or and where the how the crops are grown uh, let's never forget forget neil uh, cheap food will come at a cost to something 
you know, and um, cheap food's always been pushed by governments, supermarkets, you know, that they're pushing people. We, we are here to watch after our animals and, you know, the health of our soil and the environment and wildlife. And it's not easy, you know, to balance all these things up and produce something that's affordable for people. So when I go back to that cost, yes, it does come at a cost to the environment, to sometimes to the animals, and sometimes, you know, to the soil and the fertility of the land going forward. So we all have to re-educate ourselves on how we shop, how we eat, and, you know, seasonality is a massive thing. Um, you know, you're, you're a cult like me, you know, from the tops of Scotland. You wouldn't have avocados and tomatoes in December up there a few years ago. You know, we're shipping food from all parts of the world. And I'm not saying that we need to stop that, but we need to look at how we're shopping. And, you know, once we start to understand that this food is here and it's produced by the farmer, these supermarkets and governments aren't producing this food. Um, it's the farmers. And you're yeah. going to need a farmer three times every single day. People have forgotten about the farmers. And, Neil, people have lost a lot of respect for the people that are producing food because yeah. the supermarket yeah. shelves have always been full. And you, you wait till them um, shelves start to get empty and then we have problems. But if we can readdress this balance by bringing the power back to the farmer and the people that are buying it, you know, keep that money local, keep that money circulating within the people that have bloody worked hard to produce it. That, that's what we need. And um, it is frustrating because there's a lot of problems out there from government policies to the way supermarkets are squashing and holding their foot on the necks of a lot of farmers in yep. this country. And, and, and we need a fair price for what we're producing. Catherine, just quickly, I'm running out of time here, but um, how, how set up are the farmers? I suppose it's a re-education for them, you know, after you know, generations of just pushing everything into supermarkets. Are they, all, are they all ready to go on this, having these, having these more direct relationships with the consumers? Some are, some aren't. So one of the things we're doing is um, helping, that tr uh, helping farmers with that transition on how they maybe go from a monocrop culture to one that's more a mixed farming approach. So they've got multiple routes to market within their local community. And it means that they can serve their community with far more products. Um, so through various different schemes um, that we can talk about another time, but there's some information on the website, but we've got a lot of projects coming up through 2023-24 that are really common sense based things that will support farmers genuinely. This isn't about putting money in anyone else's pockets. This is about supporting farmers and it's about supporting communities in accessing good quality food and making sure farmers get a fair price for it. But it's also down to us, the people, to support our farmers because let's face it, government and DEFRA are doing nothing. Brilliant. I love it. I love the sound of all of that. Uh, Catherine McBean and Gareth Wynne-Jones, thank you for your time this evening. Such an important topic. Thank you both. Moving on swiftly, it's a busy night and uh, the next topic is upon us. Every year, the hides of 2.5 billion animals are used by the fashion industry. You name it, we skin it and wear it. Cattle and sheep for leather and wool, obviously, but also the hides of kangaroos, foxes, mink, lynx, crocodiles, ostriches, you name it, it's a long list. Apart from commonplace cruelty meted out to the animals, there are other impacts, including deforestation, damage to biodiversity, water pollution, and that's before you get to the plight of many poor people who are working to provide the skins and the wool and the rest. My next guest is the producer of a new film called Slay, which confronts the viewer with some of the grim reality behind a trillion dollar industry. Let's first of all have a look. This is an industry that don't want society to understand what they do. They don't want their secrets shared with the wider public. Of course they know what they are doing. It's part of the business to have a very weak traceability. I think that it will make it a lot harder for people to support these products, knowing where they came from. Uh, good evening now, Rebecca Cavelli. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me, Neil. No, no, it's a, it's a pleasure. 
tell me, Rebecca, what was it like for you making this film? Well, it was transformational because Slay is a feature documentary, 85 minutes, going into investigating the fur, leather and wool industries in seven countries. And it's not just looking at the impact that fashion has on the environment and also uh, the people, obviously, who are affected by those industries, but also looking a taking a close look at um, what happens to the animals that are you know, trapped into this system. What surprised you as you went through the process of, of making Slay? You know, what were the personal revelations that you experienced? So I think for me, the biggest thing was really the scale, to look at the scale of, you know, at which it's happening. So we're talking, as you mentioned, 2.5 billion animals that are skinned for fashion every single year, but we're also talking about, you know, the impact it has um, in the case of the leather industry, when we talk about the pollution that comes from tanneries and all the tanning sector, and a lot of the leather that we wear is actually produced in the global south. So coming, you know, face to face and up close with these issues was very confronting, especially as someone who has consumed uh, a lot of fashion, who, you know, used to really like and, and love, you know, uh, buying fashion. And um, so the, the scale is one thing. The other thing that is really shocking and that really opened my eyes is that it's actually not so difficult to find the truth and to access uh, some of the things that we found. So it was just me and my team. We hired a local crew. So it's me and my cinematographer and, you know, we show up and it's unscripted and, you know, we make some research, we show up, we talk to the right people. And what's shocking to me is that brands are not doing this work to really look at what is going on in their supply chain. You say you were a, a consumer of, of these products yourself, but what changed that for you? I'm, I'm presuming that now you look always and only for alternatives. So there's a few things. Um, for me, really along my journey, I came to the realization first that the, some of the products that I loved, for example, a handbag from a luxury brand or some of the stuff that I was wearing, I was wearing animals as an animal lover. And so that was the first thing that I had to confront myself to. And Slay is really a documentary that asked the question that I asked myself, but I also asked the viewer, is it acceptable to kill animals for fashion? And then as we, I was producing and directing Slay, the other thing that really came for me was we really need to decrease our consumption. We need to slow down. You know, the fashion industry is producing 100 billion garments every single year. 20 billion don't even hit the shelves. They are destroyed before even getting a chance of being sold. And, you know, we're just creating this huge amount of... of uh, of garments uh, all over the world that is polluting everywhere. So for me, making Slay has really gave me like a more frugal approach and a, a more mindful approach to my own consumption. And to say, you know what, we have our closet that are full, we, wa we have what we need, and uh, we need to use what we have, we need to buy secondhand. And then when it comes to alternatives, I'm happy to talk about that because when it comes to alternatives to skins and to, to animal uh, derived materials. So obviously we have a lot of the, in the case of leather, we have a lot of the vegan leather that is made of PU, so it's plastic based, and that's the incumbent, that's the existing material. Even the synthetic leather has a less worst impact on the environment compared with the animal skins. But that's not to say that we should promote, you know, plastic containing materials. When it comes to the innovation, there's a lot of alternatives that are coming up. Um, it's still a little bit behind in terms of the affordability, uh, the availability, but it's going to accelerate and it's going to happen very soon. So we are going to be able to look at, you know, uh, plant-derived materials, microbe-derived fermentation, um, cell-based even, materials that are made without, you know, killing, but also that are better for the environment, also for human health. Emma, do you think, do you think the fashion industry can ever be E ethical, <laughs> um, given given the, the the consumption that we've always had of leather and yeah, wool, and I, and I don't think it. You know, it, it it's not just the leather and the wool and the fur. It's you know, you look at the ethic, and it's been out you know, in the news the last few years, sort of where do cheap clothes come from? You know, if you're buying a mm. a t-shirt that's three quid in a department store, how is that 
How is it possible? possible? Mm. So, uh, you know, I think that fashion industry as a whole, there's real issues. And I think morally and ethically, I think people now want to know much more the story behind the brands they're buying. And it's the same for, you know, the food and the farming setup. Actually, you want to know how these animals died that you're now eating and there's these, these eggs and this milk, so yeah. How, how much awareness do you think there is of it, Nick? You know, th those figures, you know, the 2.5 yeah. billion billion animals that are harvested every year for I, clothes. I find, what I find really odd is if I go back to, you know, I remember in the 1980s, this was a big thing about like no fur and people getting like buckets of paint thrown on them. It was mm. like the virtue signaling of the 80s was really focused on this. And it's very strange to now be in 2023 and not only has it not yeah. got better, it's got worse. But people are still wearing fur. Yeah, 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 20 exactly. 20 years on. 20 years, yeah. yeah, 40 years on. I thought I mean, fur was gone. I didn't really, you know what I mean? It sort of, that was dead to me 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Re Rebecca, what is the industry saying about this? You know, you, I know that you're, there are all sorts of, you've described alternatives. Is the industry meaningfully interested in changing its ways. So the industry has no choice, but just to get back on what uh, Nick and Emma were exchanging on, um, yes, fashion as a whole has massive issues and challenges that we need to address. The reason why I wanted to focus on animals is because when it comes to the skin trade and uh, fur, leather, wool, and all the other animal-derived materials, when we talk about sustainable fashion or ethical fashion or doing better for fashion, animals are completely absent from this conversation until now and until slate, more or less. So of course, there are some organizations that have been working on these issues for a long time, as uh, Nick mentioned. But the thing is that there are also interest groups that have spent you know, a lot of time, energy, lobbying, money into making consumers feel comfortable with consuming animals in that way. And um, you know, in um, the campaign actually in the UK, uh, Fur Free Britain, that is calling people to, you know, really sit down and ask ourselves, do we want to go ahead with a ban on the sale of fur? And the reason is there are many countries that have banned uh, fur farms, for instance, because of uh, ethical issues, because also of environmental issues and public health issues, as we've seen with COVID-19. But so if we are banning this from our countries, then it's only fair that we also don't sell it if it's coming from other countries, for example, like China, where I have actually, I have been on Chinese fur farms. And so we should just walk that talk and make sure that we provide, you know, consumers with better materials. Why is the, is Slay out now? You know, are people, is it on a general release? Where can people see this? Yeah, so Slay is available for free on eco streaming platform Water Bear. So you can just sign up and watch it for free. It's also available on iTunes and Amazon. Rebecca, it's a fascinating story. It's a, I was, I find it harrowing actually. I mean, I'm not, I'm no, I'm no saint. You know, I've, I've I wear leather. I've, you know, I've got leather shoes on sitting here talking to you. But when you describe the scale of it, um, it is definitely an eye opener. Uh, and something to think about. So, R Rebecca, and, you just, know, this, thank you. Yes, <laughs> sorry, just, just to understand also, the scale is immense, but we need to understand that we are talking about billions and millions of individuals. So it's not just 2.5 billion or 100 million, it's 100 million times one individual. So this is a huge amount of suffering is really something we need to take seriously as a collective. And again, you, are, you already have your items, your garments, just use what you have. And we just have a responsibility to then move away from skins because skins are not a fabric. Rebecca Capelli, director, producer of Slay. Thank you for your time. Lovely to hear from you. Another break, yeah, again. Now, have you ever fancied being a driving instructor? There's a question that's a bit of a change of direction. The AA says your time may have come with more and more people teaching driving as a second job. We'll find out more after the break. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. The special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now, do you feel like your life and career have hit a dead end? Are you long overdue a U-turn to get back on the right road? Are you signalling your innermost need to take control of your direction in life? <laughs> in that case, my next guest could have the solution. As new research finds that half of Brits want a career change and a better work-life balance, the role of driving instructor may be the way ahead. Mark Bourne, head of the AA Driving School Instructor Training Academy, joins me now. Hi, Mark. Thanks for this. Hi, good evening. What is the appeal of a driving instructor as a career? Um, so I think driving instructors are self-employed, um, so there is some flexibility in being able to, you know, be your own boss, choose your own hours, choose your own pricing in terms of what you charge and, and you know, how you value yourself and things like that. And is there an uptake? I mean, is this actually happening? Are more and more people turning to it as a principal job, a second job? So it's always traditionally been a second job um, and traditionally, I guess, um, it's, it's, you know, it is a male-dominated industry, but it's, it's definitely changing um, and more people are coming into it earlier and, and are seeing it as a, as a, as a, an, a useful career that um, they can follow and, and I've, progress with. I have with. to say, it sounds, it's always sounded to me like a high-stress occupation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the very, my, my daughter's learning to drive at the moment. Yeah. And I'm, I'm having nothing to do with it. You know, she's got a driving instructor who's a lovely guy. But the very idea of sitting beside somebody who can't drive in a car, in traffic, <laughs> just fills me with cold terror. Yeah, I think, I think ex being an examiner, I can understand that's a terror because you're, you're expecting the person to be able to drive and, you know, you're, you're taking them for a day of assessment and, and quite often, um, unfortunately, they're not always able to. But certainly, being an instructor, you build things up step by step by step, and, and so you can you can plan for, for what's happening. And you do, you do have extent. those. You do have that. Other you do. Set of you have. You, you have. You've a, got yeah, the brake. You, you got your brake, and you have got your clutch down there in a manual, and um, so you can have that control. Um, even though they, sh again, should be rarely used um, because you're, you're planning your lessons and you're spending that time on the quieter roads, and then gradually building it up. Emma, I don't know if you ran across this, but when I was reading into the notes, last year apparently was a year of quiet quitting. A lot of people mm. just drifted away from their jobs for, well, 
a different reason for every individual, I'm sure. Um, is there, are we, do you think we're seeing something about did, are people taking stock, do you think? Yeah, and I read uh, on that, I know, I know women were much bigger a, a percentage of the quiet quitters because of the juggle and mm. kids and especially like some of the middle 30, 40 year old women and stuff. So actually, you know, as you said, it's you pick your own hours. And I think, you know, the, the issues with childcare and maintenance and, you know, bed benefits and stuff in this country is very hard for a lot of, you know, women who are the, the middle ones earning sort of, sort of 30 to 50 grand type thing and, that, and juggling small children to take jobs and pay for childcare and so actually, and do the nine to five. So actually it's kind of, it makes sense to go for, for, the, for something they can do. Mm. Do you think we're seeing a societal change there, Nick? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I would think the interesting thing is um, we're sort of expecting people to work longer. You know, we're, the retirement age for is more being years. bumped. For more years, yeah, uh, bumped on it. And yet we still have a lot of prejudice against, I mean, people over 50, never mm. mind over 60, you know, trying to, trying to work. And I think unless you have a very established career by that point, and yeah, I think, I think so I, uh, it, it's not really a surprise that we're seeing people drift away from the job market because actually past a certain point, it's, it's quite difficult for most people. Mm. Is it, you, I, I didn't realize that you see it's traditionally a second job, you know, right? It's not normally. What, uh, sorry, not as a, a second career. So it is people, oh, that, as you say, yeah, sort of reaching that, could, no, you reaching could that fit age it around something else if you. But people certainly do fit it around something else. Um, obviously, there's a challenge because you, you've got your vehicle there. You, you kind of want to utilise your vehicle as much as you possibly can. So, um, but then yeah, there are there are individuals that would perhaps share a vehicle and things like that. So there are some options. But people come to it as they're, you know, after whatever 10, 15, 20 years doing whatever. It's amazing how many people come to it and actually say, "I've wanted to do this for years." Um, and they thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, and then eventually, yeah, they, they make that shift and change. Um, but it is changing in the fact that more people are coming into it earlier um, and are seeing it as an opportunity to, as I say, work, work it around and, and have a better life balance. Really. How, how much of a rigmarole is it to learn how to be? I mean, it's all very well knowing how to drive, but, but acquiring the skill to pass on that knowledge is different. Yeah. That's a different kettle of fish. Yeah, it certainly is. I think, um, I mean, it's like with most things, people sort of, they look at it, think it's quite straightforward and simple, and, and ultimately it's not until you get into it that you realise it's a little bit more complex. Um, but certainly if you've been used to coaching somebody, mentoring somebody, um, you know, half of the population really has already taught somebody, you know, whether it's a family member or, the, you know, or their friends and things like that. So we're all quite sort of used to it, but it is, yeah, taking that time to really learn learn the, the profession a little bit and and make it work for you. Is there a character trait that lends itself, or is it like is it just that character trait that makes you a teacher? I think it's that character trait that makes you a teacher because a lot of the time as well, it's actually instructing somebody how to use the pedals, how to use the steering wheel is, is actually quite easy. But what you spend an awful lot of your time doing is actually building up people's levels of confidence and self-esteem and, and really encouraging people. It seems like when you sort of get to sort of 17, 18, there was just some things that perhaps you were a little bit more anxious about and, um, and driving sometimes can seem like that or, or not wanting to do something wrong. And so, um, so sometimes, yeah, as a driving instructor, you're doing a lot just to yeah, build confidence in people and actually make sure that they're you know, going to be ready for their driving test. And of course, not over, you know, over, and and over nervous. Is it, is it, uh, is it, will it be the case if you're a driving instructor that you're always at 17 and 18 year olds that are in your car? Is that, is that always? No, funny the, enough, the actually, way? even that sort of changing a little bit in the fact that people are choosing to perhaps go away, you know, continue education, you know, do other things and then come back to driving. So the actual average age of, of learning to drive is actually increasing a little bit. Um, and, and certainly it also then changes as well because if somebody has gone away, hasn't learnt to drive, when they do come back to learn to drive, they kind of want to do it a little bit quicker, might go for an automatic vehicle um, yeah. because, again, that's sort of seen as a little bit quicker as well. I, I can tell you hand on heart, it's the hardest thing I ever learnt how to do. I was hopeless. <laughs> as I, you know, learning how to drive, I found that <laughs> so counterintuitive. I found it, the, I found it the, the, the oddest thing to learn how to do. So I, to, to, to get people through that agony, I take my hat off to driving instructors. So it's great to hear from you. It's a fascinating idea. Mark Bourne, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you for your time. Great stuff. A final break now, after which Alessandro Savelli will be here to tell me why chef-made Italian takeaways are the next big thing in the culinary world.
Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back for the last time this evening. Now for our final topic, uh, my panellists and I have been promised some pasta treats. Uh, I've been doing my best recently to cut down on carbohydrates, wouldn't you know it, but in the circumstances, confronted with the likes of truffle uh, mac and cheese and beef shin and barolo ragu, well, one is only human after all. Here to pass the pasta is Alessandro Savelli from pastaevangelists.com who can deliver chef-made Italian treats all around London in as little as 15 minutes. Alessandro, welcome. Thank you. Tell me all about Pasta Evangelists. What was the idea, the execution of it? How did it come about? Yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Italian. I'm from Genova. Uh, and although I've been living in the UK for more than 20 years, and one day I was uh, making a tortellone by hand, and, uh, and I thought, let's start a pasta business. That simple. Hmm. Are you a chef? Is that your... No, I'm not a chef, thankfully. Uh, I like cooking, I like food. Uh, my, my family used to have a family, uh, food business in the past, but I'm not a chef. And so where, where, where does the passion come from then? Is that, is that just something that's innate for, for someone with Italian heritage? I think it is. I think, you know, when you're... It's it going to sound like a joke, but when you're Italian and you travel somewhere abroad, and you don't have pasta for more than five or six days, you have a long... You feel like you're missing something, like a, like a caffeine uh, kind of, like, feeling. Really? Uh, I have pasta every day, and uh, even before starting Pasta Evangelists. So talk us through some of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get into these. Here's a, here's a plate. Plate, Emma. If you want, and here, here we go. Super. OK. And cut the right on the go. Thank you. So I, I come from a town called Genova. OK. In the northwest. And um, 
Genova invented pesto, amongst other things, and focaccia. Okay. And so one of our, my favorite dishes is uh, lasagna al pesto. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, one of my co-founders, Finn, uh, a number of years ago said, let's do mac and cheese, mm -hmm. which is not uh, typically Italian, but, uh, but it's one of our best sellers. Mm -hmm. uh, and since the beginning of the business, we've been doing uh, beef shin ragu. Mm -hmm. uh, which is this one here. Exactly, that with tortelloni. Great. Um, so here you have three of our best sellers. Mm. We've been doing them for many years now, and um, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, you got you got to have you got to have a bit of that. I it's have a amazing. bit of everything. I'm so hungry. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the this thing I, I read in in the in the notes that you can deliver anywhere in London in 15 minutes? I'm presuming you've got more than one location. Yeah, we've got many locations all over London and out of London as well. We have also have a, a restaurant in Harrods. We have an online business. Uh, and yeah, the food will get to your house in 15, 20 minutes, cooked, ready to go. And obviously for people who are watching this who are not in London, are there yeah. any plans yeah. for... Stains? Oh, any plans to move further out? I'm, I'm thinking a lot further out than Stains. Yeah. Is that, would that class as London, do you think? Yeah, I think well, it's like Heathrow. <laughs> so we, we also have a... Um, well, we started the business as a, as a, a recipe kit business, shipping boxes uh, all over the country. So we do also send... You can order from our websites, and have pasta delivered to your home next day all over the country, seven days a week. I think, is it, is it just me thinking this, that, that Britain and Brits have, a, have adopted all manner of food cultures as mm. our own? You know, people love uh, food from the Indian subcontinent, people love pasta, you know, people love Greek food. Do you think that's a, a British trait, that we, we take these things so much to heart and have them for our own? I mean... Uh... I think uh, England's gone through a food renaissance in the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, as you said, Greek food, Indian food, pasta, pizza. Uh, some of these cuisines weren't as available 20 years ago. Now they are. Uh, the domestic cuisine is not, is not as... Uh, well, as it's our domestic cuisine. Really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, 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 li I like living in London because, on the other hand, you've got every cuisine. When you're in Italy, you might have the odd Chinese restaurant, the odd Indian restaurant, but... What you make it of the... Oh, the mac, the mac and cheese. You really, the really top. Yeah, 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 pass it over, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, this is... Uh, to have this level of food delivered to your... Well, 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 wherever you want it delivered to, I'm taking it, you can have the workplace or at home or whatever. It's a cut above, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like... It's not like your average takeaway food. Thank you. Wonderful. The truffle mac and cheese is really good, yeah. I yeah. mean, they're all great, but, yeah. I haven't done the truffle one yet. I'll get into it in a minute. No, it's delicious. The thing is that Britain and England with food, that it's just a melting pot of cultures, isn't it? Mm. And, na and nationalities. So actually it's kind of, it's, it's the obvious thing that actually you can get any kind of food everywhere. You can walk down a London street and, you know, you'll find every type of food, restaurant, cafe. Yeah. Mm. I, just, I just think we're a very welcoming. For all the bad press that we get about immigration, I think we're, a, we're very welcoming, always have been culturally very welcoming yeah. and have absorbed with great gusto mm. people and, and cultures from, from all over the world. I think it's just a, another indication of just how yeah. open to the outside world we have always been and still are. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Alessandro, thank you so much for bringing this in. Mm. That's all from me and Neil Oliver Live. Thanks, as always, to my panel. Emma Sale, Nick Tyrone, Alessandro Savelli and his delicious food, fantastic. Next up, it's Mark Bullen tonight with Neil Fox standing in as presenter. I'll see you all at six o'clock next Saturday. Hello again. As we look through Saturday night, we are going to see any rain clearing away. That will then leave things fairly chilly first thing on Sunday morning, but through the day itself, it's looking largely sunny. If we look at the bigger picture, and we have this front that's been making its way southeastwards across the UK through the day. As it's a cold front behind it, we do have colder air coming in, so things are going to turn a bit chillier as we go through the rest of the weekend. 